Hello, and welcome to the Frictionless Experience, the podcast where we lay waste to digital friction. I'm Chuck Moxley. And I'm Nick Palladino. Today, we're continuing our CXO series where we're not talking to the executive leaders of the company, but the people who are responsible for driving great digital experiences and how they get executive buy-in to deliver better digital experiences. Joining us in the Frictionless studio is Scott Smith, who has spent most of his career developing mobile experiences. So Scott's going to be our representative in our CXO series as the CMO, which stands for Continuous Mobile Optimization. Now, most recently, Scott served as a product director, organic growth and discovery at FanDuel. Before that, Scott spent three years as the director of product and partnerships at Mobivity, which is where he and I actually crossed paths in my two years heading marketing for Mobivity. Scott also spent four years on the agency side at Moxie as VP, leading customer experience, product, and mobile solutions. And for those of us who remember the venerable Hip Cricket, an early mobile technology pioneer, Scott spent three years as director of brand solutions. Scott, welcome to the Frictionless Experience. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I think we're going to have a fun, fun conversation. So first of all, tell us a little bit about your role at FanDuel and the product challenge that you and your team were tasked with there. Sure. Uh, so at FanDuel, we came in or I came into the group uh, with the goal in mind of helping with the overarching discovery of FanDuel's brand and product. Um, and that really came down to mostly organic growth from a from a search perspective so trying to in, improve the the top of funnel and the the overarching like amount of traffic we're getting in from non-branded search coming in through google or any other search terms but also even just direct traffic into fandle.com and our in our in our over our uh, overall website and, and home pages um it was something that hadn't been necessarily like 100% targeted on and 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 hit on. Um, we do have I did have a, a SEO marketing team that really put a lot of focus into it. But what what needed to be ha or needed to be put into place was like a product team to help with all the other products. So there's the sportsbook team, the casino team, and, and all the other the, the daily fantasy teams all had their own products that all had web experiences. And we wanted to be able to help them understand all the different technical challenges they might need to approach to make sure that they can rank as high as possible when anybody's searching for non-branded search terms, such as Dallas Maverick odds or Dallas Mavericks chances to win the championship, things like that, um, so that we could rank as high as we can outside of somebody just looking for FanDuel itself. Gotcha. So how much of that was, was getting people to the site versus them once they got there? And, and started interacting? Um, for the most part, like our first objective was how do we be, or how do we become the best product or company out there in our space to rank as high as we can, to get as much traffic as we can. We understand that that kind of can be a little bit of a vanity metric. We you know, understand that, hey, we drove, we drove a ton of traffic in, but now what? Um, so that's where we want to get to the point of, um, we're providing value to those users whenever they do land in that experience. They are finding what they actually searched for. They're, a, they're able to make, take that next step and either register or make their next bet or do something or find a, a valuable content so that they can make the decision whether or not to use FanDuel or a competitor or to make that next best next bet with FanDuel. So, um, you know, where we where we focused first was that discovery piece, but then we wanted to kind of slowly you know, incorporate better engagement and better conversion metrics as we continue to build out more content. Gotcha. Did you were you also dealing with like because there's a inherent challenges right or complexity in sports betting because you got to first get somebody to understand what it is how it works especially if they're they're not familiar with it right because it's it's new rolling out to different states and then you've got to get them to go through that account creation process which ne isn't necessarily easy. Tell us what that looked like for the customer and what you guys were doing to kind of optimize that and remove friction from that process. You're right. Uh, it, it is a it's a new world for a lot of people, um, unless they've been betting illegally prior prior to the, their state coming on board. But hopefully they were not. Um, you know, as states have been coming on board legally over the last five years, uh, more and more people are becoming more accustomed to what sports betting and sport, sports gambling is. 
So it's a whole new world. They, they're, most of our customers have been transferring over from daily fantasy. So they're using that as a flywheel effect of getting people in the door of people like that were most recently like in North Carolina, tons of tons of customers using the daily fantasy cut, um, application and easily be able to transition that account into uh, sports betting. Now it's time to educate and help people kind of hold their hand and get get into that point of either um, transferring that account registration into Sportsbook or um, just be able to make that first bet and and, and kind of combine their, their experiences across the board. So that's that's a little bit of one of the challenges that, that was always being made was like, these are two different products, but how do you make sure that people start to understand that this is FanDuel, not just FanDuel DFS, FanDuel Sportsbook, FanDuel Casino. It's, it's all the same. And, and how do we get to the point where it is a, a singular experience for everybody? Yeah, that's really interesting, especially when you're thinking about a mobile application, right? Because the mobile application is going to drive that that uh, individualized, I guess, vertical, if you will, of, of the three different ones. Um, I know I personally have a, a big experience with FanDuel in daily fantasy sports. Um, and it's, it's interesting to hear that it's just fundamentally a, a different part because, you know, from, from my vantage as a, as a DFS player, I, I still think of it as sports betting. So it's interesting to see that that's, that's different. Yeah. And I guess the, the difference that what you would hear from the regulators or everybody or anyone else in the daily fantasy sports field is that's a game of skill. Uh, these are not necessarily bets that you're making, but, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, experts out there that, that are very skilled and being able to pick the right players on the right teams to, to get the highest scores. Not So they're not actually putting you know money up against the house. Right. And then there's a, uh, there, there was a whole litigation aspect to DFS years back. I remember that that was all about figuring out, probably answering a lot of, of what you just said there, which is it's a game of skill. I don't know much about it, but I'm sure that was a big aspect of, of kind of breaking that out into its own individual experience, right? And inside the app. Uh, right. Well, it's, I mean, there are two different apps. So you've got the Daily Fantasy app and then you have the Sports app. So they are completely separate today. Um, and that's the same thing for, for all um, companies out there in this world. You know, DraftKings, same thing, um, have multiple apps for the different types of products. Um, and yeah, um, going back to 2016, 2017, whenever that, that litigation was happening, especially in New York and Texas, like um, being able to look at the different, uh, I guess, definition of what those games were um, and getting it to where it is today has gotten um, these companies to, you know, a fantastic spot and be able to kind of get that, uh, that jump start into the sports betting field in 2018. So I guess where I'm going with it is, do you feel like that litigation is kind of why there are multiple apps and why there's a, a, a disconnected experience between the idea of actual sports, sports betting and, and DFS? Because to me, like it, I would imagine I would want my customers to get one good look and feel coming into my brand. And when you enter that brand, then that's the experience that you're expecting. And through that experience, I could either lead into the DFS journey or I could lead into the sports betting or the, uh, you also said casino, but we're not talking as much about that so far. Right. Um, it's, a, it's probably a little bit out of my wheelhouse to be able to answer that uh, cleanly um, to know, you know, is that why there are multiple apps? Um, I, I couldn't necessarily answer that because it, it did the, the decisions were made on that way before my time. Um, at what I could say is, you know, where we were attempting to go, especially from the web experiences, um, across the board was, you know, if you enter FanDuel.com, just the homepage, you know, what are you expecting to see there? And you're looking, you're probably looking to ex see a, a breadth of what the FanDuel products are. And how do you try to try to get to the point where you are providing context to that user whenever they land there? Are they a sports book user? Or are they a fantasy user? Or are they a casino user? Those sorts of things. Um, and so that's where you can kind of have that centralized view of what the FanDuel brand is and then give them the choice to branch out into the product that they choose. So that's, that would be like the differences that, that I was really looking at from our perspective in my group was um, you know, the web experience could be a whole lot different than what the app experiences were, but they were going to influence and, and complement what the apps can bring to the table. 
Very cool. And I've seen brands, not necessarily in the, in the betting world, obviously, but I've seen brands kind of go back and forth. So you'll, you'll go into that one consistent experience where you're breaking it apart. And then you say, you know what? No, we're going to, we're going to break this entirely apart. And we're going to have individualized experiences. And then it goes back together. Then it comes back apart. And it seems like those ebbs and flows just come from, I guess, the pros and cons of having individualized and customized experience of, of any specific journey versus trying to give all customers one look and feel of, of brand value. So it's just an interesting, interesting use of, of that concept. Yeah, absolutely. Were, were the things that you were doing and your team were doing to remove friction in that discovery process and in that getting the account set up so you could place that initial bet, especially relative to your competitors like ESPN and DraftKings, were you like trying, were you, sort of benchmarking their experiences and trying to find ways to make that less frictionless for FanDuel prospects? Yeah, I think that you're always keeping an eye on the competitors and understanding what are they doing, especially with some new folks in the space. You know, you got ESPN and, and Fanatics coming into the space and DraftKings is always trying to stay at the forefront of what their experience can be. Um, and there's more and more that come in on a, on a almost – monthly basis it feels like um that are finding niches and you're finding they're finding new ways to engage with customers and, and maybe even simplify some of the bigger pieces of what um, a sports book could probably bring to the table um so i think that we've always did a, a decent job of you know staying up to um the most recent experiences that, that we were seeing across the board um I always kind of push the team to say, yeah, be aware, but don't get distracted by what other companies are doing because who's to say that theirs is right and ours is wrong or ours is right and theirs is wrong. Um, the people to say that is the customer themselves. So we tried to you know, really spend a lot more time with um, doing the customer research and understanding what, who are who is interacting? How are they interacting? Why are they interacting? You know, who's who's searching on Google, and why are they, and what are they searching for? And how do we make sure that we're providing them with the right experience once once they do land um, within our web web products and web experiences? Because um, if we're only looking at the competitors, then you know who's to say that they're actually asking the customer the customers the same thing? Um, so if we if we focus on making sure the customer saw value and what we were providing to them, that's where we wanted to maintain that focus and see wins and continue to see, you know, improved engagement, optimization opportunities and you know, continue to grow from there. Now, one interesting challenge with sports betting that people may not be aware of is that in the end to actually place the bet and do that, do the uh, participate you have to do it on a mobile device. You can start out on the website, but you end up having to download a, 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 the mobile app and do it there. Explain why that is. Yeah, so there there is a third party partner of most of the sportsbook pro properties out there that um, regulators require the companies to use to actually verify their their current location. So it's all about getting to that really finite, where is this person at the time of making the bet? Um, and the only way we can do that is either through desktop web or through the mobile application. So a user could get all the way through their, their mobile journey and um, on, their, on the website, on the mobile sportsbook web, go through the registration, go through the first time bet, or sorry, go through the registration, first time deposit, be ready to make that bet and then be notified that, I'm sorry, you need to install the application to, to make this bet. Um, so that just comes down to you know, requirements for us to have a certain level of location verification. Um, there, there are discussions about like, are there other ways, other, other mousetraps in where, in order to be able to, to, you know, allow for mobile web experiences like that. Um, but at this point in time, that's kind of where we sit across the entire industry. And, um, so it's either make the bet on desktop web or through the mobile apps, mobile application. And what are some of the things then that you all were doing to try to remove that the friction from that if somebody started their journey on the FanDuel website, you know, whether it was in the way you communicated or the process to try to make that a little, a little more frictionless. 
Um, I don't, I wouldn't say it was something we were trying to do. I think we were in discussions about some of these things. Like whenever we look at how do we make product improvements, we wanted to always look at it from the perspective of what's the biggest opportunity that we can hit on that objective. Um, and that is a huge opportunity. How do we make it very simple for users to understand what it, how are they going to have the simplest experience possible without, with the least amount of friction? Um, so we had started to have discussions about when is the right time to communicate that to users? Is it prior to inst or I mean, is it is it prior to registration? Is it prior to first time deposit? Like where where do you actually communicate that to people? Like, um, or is it? Let me go back to even like the the very first time that you come to FanDuel.com, the homepage. One of the things that you'll see if you go there is on desktop, it's going to say uh, join now. And on mobile device, it's going to render out to say download now. So we wanted to make sure that we are going directly into that install experience um, directly from the very beginning. So we didn't even give them the option if they're on a mobile device to, to go through that registration flow. And we saw that that was increasing uh, the amount of engagement, the, ima the, the, the amount of installs happening, the amount of um, you know, overall conversions happening. Got it. And, and that, that process, I would imagine you had a certain number of people who would start the process, then get into it. Cause you have to give an ID, you have to do the deposit. They would fall out somewhere in that customer journey. What are some ways you tried to get to, to solve for that, whether it's removing friction or the way you communicate it to try to get as many people to complete the entire journey of registering and getting to where they could download the app and and place their first bet yeah th so that would have been a little bit outside of my team's remit um we you know i partnered with uh groups that would specifically look at how to optimize um those conversion metrics um so they were always constantly looking at new ways in which to, to improve the um the verification methods or you know how quickly can we um make sure and um, reduce the amount of anxiety that somebody has whenever they're you know, putting in their phone number or their, or their IDs. But there's a, there are a lot of different third-party partners. There's a lot of different ways in which we can do that. And so I think it's going to be a constant evolution and constant optimization effort uh, for those teams. But I, I couldn't speak directly to, to what they were actually working on specifically. That sounds like a lot of the early crypto days where you would, uh, and by early, I mean like, you know, three, four years ago, um, where there was like, like regulation was still catching up to, to what was going on. And then all of a sudden to go sign up for one of these, uh, Bitcoin exchanges, you would have to provide a scan of your driver's license and you'd have to do all this like weird stuff. But then there was a whole bunch of phishing aspects that happened as a result of that. Cause they were like, Oh, this is the perfect time to go start stealing a bunch of people's information. So now all of a sudden you have to be super careful if you're trying to get into this environment, which is already risky in the first place for different reasons, but you're, you're trying to get into this environment and then all of a sudden there's all this really weird thing. So it's interesting. You say anxiety. That's a, that's a very interesting word to use, uh, especially around, um, you know, money value. Hundred uh, percent. I think that 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 word can kind of gets to be um, forgotten about when we talk about overall user experiences. But you think about the amount of anxiety that somebody has when they're purchasing any purchases purchasing anything, uh, let alone like a major decision that you're making, and and you know choosing a sports book or cho choosing a partner or making a big bet is you know a big decision to be made. Making sure that um, you know everything feels kosher, everything feels like it's um, you got to be fully supported and, and uh, protected. Um, you know, I, I, I'll go back to uh, a previous employee or, or a job whenever we were working on some of the Verizon wireless purchasing of a phone and purchasing of a phone plan. We were asking people and getting to the point and understanding the amount of anxiety people were, ha were having as they're making a purchase or making a decision for their device or a new phone plan or adding a line. And like it, they were having the same amount of anxiety as they would be to have a, to buy a car. And so it's, it doesn't, it, the, the, the amount that somebody is going to be purchasing doesn't necessarily affect the, the anxiety level. I think that we're just a very anxious uh, group of people. I mean, just the, like people in general are very anxious. Uh, so how do we make sure that people like, feel comfortable in making decisions like this? And I think that that ultimately does reduce friction uh, by a wide margin. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I could definitely relate to 
Um, back when I did DFS and, and back when I started getting these exchanges, there is absolutely, you're ready to hit that button even to, to place your first team for DFS. There's an anxiety aspect to it. And it, it's like, a, I don't know, my first one was probably a dollar, maybe. I don't know, but like, but there's still anxiety to it that it's really not that big of a deal. Like I, you know, I willy nilly, I'll go over and, and buy a, a Starbucks coffee for $6 happily. And, and then I'm anxious over the fact that my DFS team might not be perfectly optimized. Right. Yeah. Because it's the chance of you winning a million dollars if you got it right. Right. Yeah. It's not that well. well. <laughs> yeah. I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't think I ever had a chance of winning a million dollars. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Much bigger upside. <laughs> well, there's also the security side of it because few purchases you make, although you've now touched on two, which is sports betting and, and cellular phone purchase require IDs, right? And, and in a digital world where you're worried about, uh, fraud and, and people stealing your information and stuff, having to show an ID in the, in a digital process, I imagine adds a lot of anxiety and friction. Yeah, 100%. And not only that, but just annoyance, I think, for some people. Like, how many times are you making a purchase on your mobile phone and you're laying on the couch and you're like, well, my my wallet's in the other room. Never mind. I'll do it another day. Um, so it's, it's you know, those sorts of friction points also. It's not just the anxiety. It's not just the security. It's, um, you know, is, is my wallet within arm's reach at this point in time? Yes, no. No? Okay, well, like... I'll do it tomorrow and hopefully I, I remember. Right. No doubt. I Total tangent, but you know, like the clear line at the airport nowadays, you go through the clear line and then every now and then they need to re-verify your ID and then you'll have to actually pull it out and show them. I had a time where I had to like show my ID three different times and this took me maybe five seconds. And the first time I'm like, whatever, no big deal. Because they're right there, right? You just pull it out and you show it. The second time I'm like, all right, come on, something's wrong. The third time I was like, really? I have to, I've had to do this three different times in a row now. Like that's the kind of stuff that, that, you know, in that experience, even though it's functionally not that big of a deal, it really takes away from, from what you're trying to build where clear is trying to build this, this frictionless entry into the airport. You know, what we're trying to do here is build this frictionless ability to place a bet and having to remember your wallet or think that your wallet's in the other room, that is just functionally another thing that they have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of clear, I mean, like, I would, I'd love to know how much of their business is getting hit by this digital ID stuff. That they oh, yeah. No doubt. Do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, us commoners have to pull out our IDs every time, Nick. But they, they've clearly set a ex expectation of a more frictionless experience. And it's funny because now your expectations have changed and you're disappointed at a much lower level than you would have been if you didn't have clear, right? Well, you want to know disappointment with the clear line is I jumped in one one time and the clear agent literally told me, you should go through TSA pre-check. It'll be faster. Oh, yeah. Really? And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it wasn't like a, the TSA person. It was the actual clear person. And it's like, okay, you have a, a, a service that is, you know, lacking confidence in yourself. Like that's, that's a big deal. But that said, I'm, I'm roasting them, but I actually really do love clear. Clear, clear helps out a ton, especially at the Atlanta airport. It's, it's in it's really great. So the, the, the comment, Scott, about they have to go get their wallet is a very interesting take on a concept that we've talked about multiple times on the show because many guests have brought up when you take digital and match it to a physical. And Paul Stonick from uh, uh, Savannah College of Art and Design actually used the term fidgetal, and we've now picked up on that. Typically, we've talked about like with stores, but that's another form of fidgetal where you have to to sort of break it's almost like an acting you break character and have to go to a physical thing and then come back into the the digital experience and i know in your past experience you have a lot of experience with fidgetal like at mobivity where we were using qr codes for offer redemption and, and attribution talk about your approach to integrating qr codes and, ge and geolocation we were using features there on that to to enhance that customer experience at thousands of physical locations how you bridge the gap 
Yeah, sure. Um, and before I even get into that, I want to go into like two, 14 years ago, I was selling QR code programs. And like, I wish that, you know, I, I was just laughing with a couple of our founders or one of our founders at CMO of uh, what was Ogme that turned into Hep Cricket. Um, we were texting the other day and you're we like, yeah, QR codes finally made it to, you know, 14 years later. It's like, yeah, it only took a pandemic and, uh, you know, a Super Bowl commercial to make it happen, but you know, take what we can get. Um, it's, uh, there's always been ways in which we can improve the overall, you know, experience for redeeming coupons and promos and all those sorts of things like we were never going to continue to clip coupons out of newspapers and magazines and you know try to find trying to find them and hold on to them because everybody always forgot them at home so what do you never forget at home you never forget your phone you always have your coupons your promotions or something on, like that on your device so then we have to start to think about well how do we make sure that people remember that they have those promotions and coupons on their phones because most people will even forget, even if they have an app for it. Um, so when we were working at Mobivity and like working with Subway and um, Sonic and you know, a few of our other clients, like it was um, not only can we send them a text message that has a unique code that can be redeemed in store, but we can also think about how do we remind people that they, they have those because we can detect whether or not that promotion or that coupon is actually being used or not and make sure that uh, people find value in what they ha were sent um, in their text messages. Uh, so I think that there there's a lot of like friction points of people always forget. People always um, have things available to them and never use them. How many times have you gone to the store and then walk out the store and get all the way home? You're like, I forgot to use that dang coupon that was in my pocket. Or I forgot to use that coupon that was on my phone, whatever. Like, how, So how do we also improve on that? I think that there's a, there's a lot of different ways in which you can do that with um, geolocation. Um, like there's like the Apple wallet functionality that, that just never took off. Like it works great for, for um, your boarding passes for, you know, for airlines. So like we want to continue to talk about airlines. Like that's one of the best places where we talk about reducing friction with a mobile device. Um, there's movie tickets, there's, you know, concert tickets, all those. And I just went to the Braves game and I've got my Braves ticket on my phone. And whenever I got within a half a mile of the stadium, it's sitting there right on my home screen on the Apple wallet. Um, you know, I'm never going to have to fumble through and find Ticketmaster or whatever. It's always going to be sitting there on my home screen. How do we make that happen more often whenever I walk into a subway or I walk into a store and say, oh, well, here's my coupon. I, it's, it's there waiting for me. I don't have to remember what app it was in or was it in a text message? Where was it in the text message? Those sorts of things. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for brands to, to improve on that overall if they want to kind of provide more value in that space. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of, you know, credit card offers and you, you log in and to your app and then you can start adding all these. They're, they're effectively coupons, right? Um, all you have to do to redeem one, or at least for American Express, all you have to do to redeem one is just go in and do the thing. Yeah, user. That's it. Pay yeah, just card, right? Right. But they so, got American Express remind you that whenever you are within a half mile of one of those stores that you've already added to your wallet that, hey, don't forget, you added this, you, you want to use this today? I, I, you, you're going to spend 10 minutes going through and check, checking every single one you've, you've got, and then you're going to forget which ones you checked. That's a, that's a chore. Because if you got multiple credit cards, you have to go, Oh, I know I had a deal somewhere. You got to go look it up before you can actually make the purchase. It's, it's a, it adds a lot of friction. I will say. I, I'll tell you the, the friction side of it for me is I go and I buy something. Like I just bought a, a suit for a wedding and that I'm going to be in, in, in October on Macy's. And then I thought to myself, you know what I should do? I should go check and see if there's a promo. And there was, but now I, I don't get it because I already have the transaction and I can go at it and I can cancel, but I don't want to bother doing that because that's just too much friction. Right. So like to me, there should be some type of like 
I don't know. Maybe that's just user error. I need to blame myself more than anything I, here. But I, I don't know. I do think there's more friction. I think Scott's onto something with how do you simplify that so people remember. And geolocation is an interesting concept on it, uh, an interesting take on it. Now, that's not going to help you on online purchases because you're going to be sitting at the same computer. <laughs> they don't know which which merchant, although although I guess they've they've tried to do that with the shopping portals that some of them use. Um, you know, the other thing that was interesting about the QR codes, as I remember at Mobivity was there was a backend benefit because it allowed individual offers. That was the value of the QR code versus in a newspaper, right? When you print it, you get, everybody gets the same offer. Then you have to worry about coupon fraud and copying of offers and that kind of stuff. We were able to do individual offers. So Nick's offer would, it could only be redeemed, could be redeemed one time. And then that, that offer was no longer good. And that was the value of the QR code. And it allowed on the back end, the attribution piece for the merchant to know how many offers were purchased. And we could tie it back to the transaction to know how much did Nick spend on that transaction. And therefore, you know, what was that, the return on that or the ROI? Why are you um, so interested in tracking my spins, Chuck? <laughs> I was just using you as an example. I could have said Scott. <laughs> could have said Dom. You're right on, Chuck. I mean, you're refreshing my memory now and thinking about this whole pitch. And it, it made complete sense. And especially looking at your book back in the back, the audience of one, like how do you actually connect the dots between that individual user and what did they buy? And But then – like if 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 we sent that text message or that that unique Q, QR code to that user to Nick and he redeemed it, well, that's all going to be that's going to be connected to his phone number. That phone number is going to be connected to his loyalty account. His loyalty account is going to now be able to see how many times has Nick redeemed this these different types of coupon codes and maybe even earn points and do all those sorts of things. So like, how do you connect the dots to an individualized unique promo code? to an individual person rather than just giving a you know 10% off for buying 10 sandwiches. That's a whole different type of lo loyalty program. You know, otherwise you're just, you know, sending, um, you know, you're, you're breaking up a 10% off over 10 different purchases versus, you know, really providing value to somebody and really feeling like somebody is going to continue to interact with your brand because they can see things that they're purchased and, you know, connecting the dots be behind all those. So, um, I think you're really hitting on something that just I have not ever really seen a brand really take advantage of that type of opportunity before. And I'd, I'd like to really try to dig in and understand why, because I think there is a huge opportunity there. Yeah, I wonder if it's a lack of awareness as well as, you know, a perception that it would take a lot of complexity to do. And, it, and you know, there is technology involved, but it wasn't that hard um, to ultimately implement. So, so going back, and this could be across either at FanDuel or all your experiences, but how in the past have you measured or quantified that friction in the customer journey? Like how do you, and then the flip side is how do you quantify the value of delivering a frictionless experience so that, so that there's justification to invest in that? Um, well, sticking to our theme on, on mobile, it's you know, you, I'm still going to look at it from the entire customer journey, all the way from discovery through advocacy. And you know, the first off is you know, first thing is you know, how do you get maintain traffic and grow the traffic into your experiences wherever you're trying to drive people to? Is it to your homepage? Is it to a specific landing page promotion? Um, whatever it might be, or even just directly into the app store to install the app. You're going to be able to measure on, you know, did you make it simpler for somebody to get to where they were trying to get to? Then it's, did you provide them with the value and what they expected there? You know, that's number, I think that's one of the biggest things that kind of gets forgotten is, all right, we got them there. Did they stay? Did they, did they do what we expected them to do? Did, did they find value in what you built? Um, if not, you're going to see the bounce rate go out through the roof. If um, Let's take a, take an app install example, for example. Uh, I was talking to somebody that worked for um, yesterday. Uh, he worked for a company that we overlapped with. He worked for a QSR, and he, and he helped build an app for them. And we, they, 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 they provided a lot of free stuff to install their app. Um, but then you know, it was 95% drop-off. Like nobody reused the app. So – that obviously there's friction there that, or is it just, was it just not valuable? So like, 
what's the difference between friction and value? I think there's there's something that needs to be thought of in like how those kind of join together. Um, because if there is enough value there, people are willing to take, you know, go through more friction to get there. Um, when I think about, um, you know, search experiences, um, you know, we, we constantly look at how do we get rank, how do we rank as high as we can in the top three, ideally, uh, because you're not going to get much traffic coming from anywhere below five or 10. Um, there's a lot of new things that Google's always going to be doing. And so how do we measure upon how are we impacted by what Google is changing? I don't know if you saw the release last, yesterday on everything new Google, but it's going to change the game in terms of what you're going to see on your search results because it's going to now start to um, really uh, provide you with a, a synopsis of a lot of different content that, you, that Google will find on the internet for you and then just provide that to you in their Gemini uh, approach rather than here's a, here's a link for you to go read and here's three more links for you to go read here. Why don't I just condense those three or four articles for you and just give you a quick synopsis. Like, sorry, I went on a tangent there. Like my mind went into a different place, but that's another place and how you can actually judge that is, um, you know, how successful were you in, in actually, um, pivoting and innovating alongside Google because we all know that that is the end all be all for driving an additional you know, discovery traffic. I started to see that as I, I guess it was kind of a beta or pre-announcement release, the AI summary of the search results. And the first thing I thought was, wow, this is going to drop organic search volume across the board because you don't have to click through there's going to be so many users that just hit Google and stay on Google. And then their next step of the journey is a different Google search rather than clicking through on to anything, any topic. So it's just going to drop so much traffic. And I don't know if this is a, a, a market share game or if they, they really have some type of, of uh, goal of, of providing less clicks of the internet in general. Um, but uh, it's, but it's a really interesting result. But there was a precursor to that, and that's when they started providing the result right at the top. I forget what what that's called, where they were trying to preempt you having to go to the website. So they've been doing this for a while, right? But they would always provide this the cert the uh, the the source. And what they were saying back then, and what they're saying now is tests show that a lot of people still click through. There's a very high click through rate on the source that they do cite and provide. And I know an anecdote of the old the version experience. or what's coming out. Both. They said testing even on the new AI version, it actually increased the number of clicks over to the sources that they use for that article. That that's what they're saying. I don't know. You know, I have no proof. I haven't I haven't gotten a chance to use it yet. But but you know, it's a it's, everything is changing so rapidly. The the great part, I think, is you know what I think it was Mike Lively talked about on a prior episode where he talked about the core web vitals and the way Google looks at all of that still also impact what happens when you get to the website and still improve that user experience and provide so the, a, yeah. So the, the, like, I feel like I need to pour a whiskey now, but this, d does this mean that this AI result is going to have its own organic search mentality to try to figure out how to play against the results of being inside that algorithm? To me, that seems like it's the natural next step. If you're telling me that driving organic search is based on the AI out output, then I need to figure out how my data is inside the AI output. That's my goal. Right. Right. Good point. Good point. And I'm sure there will be many experts who come out with guides on how to do that. <laughs> you get on Once they figure it out. Yeah, there are already a bunch of experts out there for sure. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and the way that, that Google approaches everything, you know, they want they they're they're gonna definitely index higher on better mobile experiences. That's just what they do. That's they they put that focus there. Um, yeah, and then a lot of that comes down to that better UX, you know, the better experience, better value. Are people finding what they were expecting to find on that experience? So, um, I think what you were also referring to uh, earlier was that, like the featured snippets, Chuck. Like, how do you get the snippet up at the top? 
Um, we, we actually played around with this quite a bit. Um, and it's, it was amazing how quickly we were able to get feature snippets up at the very top, uh, by, you know, just, you know, pinpointing some big opportunities there. Um, and that's, that's even like, that's, that's location or rank zero. Like you're, you're above one if you're in that feature snippet. So, I mean, that was, that was a pretty big, uh, lofty goal for us that we were able to hit. So AI is now minus one. It's one, one level above the AI produced answer, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, if you think back to like what, um, you know, Bezos would always say back whenever he first started, it was like, I want to get your, the product that you want on your, on your doorstep before you even know you want it. Like, how is that not what Google's doing right now? Like they're going to provide you some sort of content based on what you just searched before you even knew you wanted it. And it's going to be, you know, a great, you know, you know, synopsis of everything that you could potentially go search. And like, they're, they're just going to expect to show you exactly what you're looking for. I feel like we could do a whole episode on this topic. So, so Scott, going back to the quantification piece and understanding the value of removing friction at FanDuel, how did you elevate the conversation of friction to your leadership? Like how, what are the ways you tied your team's efforts to business outcomes so that you could get the support you needed from leadership and the budget needed to optimize those experiences? Um, I th think that if you just look at our OKRs uh, across the team, you know, we, we understood that if we could impact the amount of traffic we could get into the experience um, and then measure how many people were actually converting, you can see, you know, there's bit, there's, there were opportunities. Um, so, you know, it was you know, very evident in the data to be able to see where we needed to improve upon um, friction and friction opportunities and, and lower levels of conversion rates. And um, it, it, I don't think it was really that, that much of a hard task to, to just find new ways in which we could improve the overall experience to get people into what we would call an activation faster than they did they were before. Uh, so it was, it was, you know, pretty evident in the data that, you know, there were things that we could do to improve upon. Yeah, I would imagine the ultimate conversion for FanDuel was to get somebody to place that first bet. If they got all the way through the activation process, place that first bet, what you're hoping is they're hooked, and now they continue to come back and place more bets. Yeah, absolutely. Was, yeah, the, the first bet. Um, I always wanted to expand it a little bit further than that. Like if you look at you know how Chamath uh, would always um, define what an activation was at Facebook was you know if you find what did, what was it ten friends in seven days and so like it was more than just activating your account or registering for your account or adding one friend. It was how do you get somebody to add ten friends in seven days? Well, you know how do you get somebody to you know in a sports betting field or a DFS field or whatever? How do you get them to make X number of bets in how many days or whatever that might be? Um, I think there is an opportunity for us to kind of go a little bit further than that. It's also interesting, just you know, very anecdotal and, and personal. But I you know I played DFS what ten years ago I think, um, and I haven't since. So is that its own individual KPI? And do I need to go replace a first bet? Like it wouldn't literally be my first bet, but it would be like a re-first bet. Um, would that be something that's kind of like, how do I get that, that engaged user that used to do this, that has exited to now come try the new version of it? Because I'm sure you guys have long since advanced what I remember. Yeah, from the DFS standpoint, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's going to be, there's always going to be efforts to, um, what would they call it? Reactivate, you know, somebody. Right. Um, but you would still be in the system as long as you're using the same email address. Um, your, your account should be still live. You know, it's just, um, you know, what are the what are all the efforts in which a company could could take for reactivation? It's you know, sending an email. I haven't seen you in three years. Don't forget. You know, it's like, <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, I don't, yeah, that might be rough. Yeah, but uh, there's, there's there's a lot of different ways you could do that. Um, and I, I, you know, I've seen that before. Like, if, especially like if it'd be similar to like just abandoned shopping cart, right? It's now it just comes down to um, what's the time frame in which you're willing to to send that out because that's a, it's not cheap to be able to send out all those reactivation emails either. 
So Scott, what's a widely held belief about building frictionless experiences that you fundamentally disagree with? Something that people, you think people get wrong. That you need an app for everything. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, so this is ironic, I guess, or I, maybe the right word for it, but I've been, you know, quote unquote, the mobile guy at a few different places in my, in my career. Um, and I've never been one to really preach or be the first to say, yeah, well, let's build an app for that. Or I think, I think an app is the right solution for that. Um, too many times, uh, that's the first answer because that's what the executives know. I'm like, Hey, we need to build an app. Well, what a product manager should then do is like, well, why do you think we need an app for that? You know, is what's the what's the solve what's the problem you're trying to solve is it trying to get them to do a simple task well you can do that very simply with you know a very well funded and and, and well thought out mobile web experience if we put 50 percent as much thought into building a great mobile web experience as we do in building apps we would it would be fundamentally different in in the overall world of mobile experiences but you know, Apple's got us all, you know, very well wrapped around their finger. And they say, you got to have to have an app. And you know why they want that? It's because they're going to make 30% on every single purchase you make on those things. So, you know, I know that's not necessarily true. There's there's some workarounds there. But um, even look at, here's an example for you on, on a huge company that has decided to, you know, even take some of their conversions out of apps is... Um, and I want to, I, I never understood why, but are you audio book listeners? Like if you, you listen or, or, or yeah, you listen, use Audible or, um, or Kindle. Are you, do you read on your iPads or anything? You know, I have a Kindle. <laughs> I never use it. I, I've gotten to almost all Audible audio books. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I read on my iPad all the time that I'm using right now. Um, I can't purchase, um, an actual Kindle book through the Amazon app, I have to go into the amazon.com website in order to purchase the app to then get it added to my Kindle. Talk about friction, but you know, there's a reason why they're doing that. And you know, they were trying to get away from using the app itself. So man, I went on another tangent. Um, so uh, essentially, you know, if we want to look at what's a utility that you need to have for an app, that somebody's going to need to use that on X, Y, Z amount of times per day, per month, per, per year. Maybe there's a use for it, but not every restaurant can be Starbucks or Chick-fil-A. Not every, uh, you know, retailer can be, um, Amazon, right. You know, but you know, so if it's going to be a once a year purchase, why do I need an app for that? I, I love hearing that. And one of the correlations that I see people get wrong all the time is they say, yeah, our conversion rate's so much better than the app or something along those lines. And they're not, they're fundamentally missing that they developed a highly loyal customer that, that downloaded the app and they are highly loyal. And that's why they are converting better. That's what's the correlation. It has nothing to do with app versus mobile web. And so focusing so much attention towards the app is prioritizing your loyal customers. Absolutely. But it's for the wrong KPI and the wrong conclusion. And so you, you, you really have to get back and understand, I want to earn that app download rather than I want to drive users to the app arbitrarily. Right. The app's not converting them better. The loyalty is. 100%. We saw, saw that a lot in QSR. You see it a lot in QSR where if you want to get the coupon, you have to download the app. And that's the only way to get it. And they're forcing you to do it. But I know, Scott, we talked about this in Mobivity all the time as our argument for text messaging is you are, you are only going to download so many apps, so many mobile apps. There, you don't go to 25 restaurants regularly. You go to three regularly. And once you've surpassed that, you won't, you simply won't do it. And so it's the, it's too much friction. There's too, you know, you don't have unlimited space on your app, on your phone. You can't find it half the time. Right. So there's so many arguments. I, I think, I think you hit it spot on that it's this, everybody thinks they need an app. It was, it was, damn it. It was those commercials where they go, there's an app for that. Remember there's an app for that. And they, they convinced you, you had to have an app for everything. And 
I agree hundred percent. I think you're yeah. doing something. And and I you know, there was there were all these opportunities for progressive web applications and just with with the speed of the internet that we have, the speed of you know five G today that we have today, you can load a pretty magical mobile web experience today. And you can still do Face ID, you can still do Apple Pay, you can still do a lot of the things that you, that you can do in an app. Um, you can still you know, make it easy for people to log in to personalize the experience. I mean, just if you just put the effort into you know, building something that can constantly be update, updated and iterated on, you know, that's another problem with the app is like it's really hard to, to, to test and optimize and, and, and experiment with, with an app. Other than you know building it in React, and now you're actually just putting a you know, web view in the app, and what, well, why not just build it in web? And if you're going to do that anyways, well, and we have a lot of customers at at uh, Blue Triangle that have apps, have native apps, but they pull in a lot of mobile web content. It's a, that hybrid approach, and we actually have to stitch those sessions together to provide the full full view. But but I think what they're finding is why recreate a bunch of content like product listings and things like that. In an, in a native app experience when you can just pull it in off, mo off a mobile web and the user will not know the difference. It will seem like it's the same experience. Yeah. Great, great. We could do a whole episode on that too, too, Nick. All right. So Scott, what are one or two final recommendations for listeners that they should apply in their own rules to base or excuse me, own roles to drive more frictionless digital experiences coming out of this conversation? Hmm. <laughs> We've got all over the board, so it's going to be hard to pull one or two, but yeah. <laughs> I, I think I, one of the things that gets lost is the influence that you can drive with a mobile device in a user's hand um, to make a purchase. And that purchase does, and that conversion does not have to be in that, 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 that one session on their mobile device, you know, it could just be influencing them to then go open their computer or go walk into the store or whatever it is. And that influencing factor gets forgot about a lot. Um, I mean, this was eight years ago um, when we were working with Verizon Wireless, like it was, you know, the influencing factor on just doing your research and doing your shopping on a mobile device because I'm laying on the couch and just bored. And then I, it actually influences me to go into the store and go purchase. That was always just forgotten about and never part of, well, that's why we should invest in mobile or mobile because, or why we should not invest in mobile because all the purchases and conversions are happening on desktop and in store. Why should we invest in mobile? So that, that was eight years ago. And obviously that's changed since then, but don't forget about the influencing factor of when people are doing their research and, and those sorts of things to, to make that final purchase. Great. Well, thanks for a great conversation, Scott. Where can listeners find you? Where's the best place for you to connect? Uh, I'm all over LinkedIn. Uh, Scott A. Smith. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of Scott Smiths out there. So um, it is slash IN slash Scott A. Smith. Um, and I am on Twitter at Scott Sooner. Um, and I, I don't dabble in the TikToks or the Snaps or anything. So you're not going to find me there. All right. Perfect. Well, Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Frictionless Experience. And remember to follow us on your favorite podcast player app so you automatically receive notifications when we upload new episodes. And leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Let us know what you think and what topics you want us to cover in future topics. We'd be happy to cover anything that might be causing you friction. And of course, you can always find and connect with me and Nick on LinkedIn. I'm Chuck Moxley on LinkedIn, M-O-X-L-E-Y. And Nick is... In Paladino.